Where you were born, Professor? Pugnutian? I was born in Iran in 1943. During the Tehran conference? During the Tehran conference. So I always tell my students that I'm the new Jesus because when I was born, three wise men came to visit me. But unfortunately, most of them were not wise and I didn't turn out to be Jesus, so. <laughs> But do you have any any do you have any memories? Do you, how you can recall the, the the Tehran? Do you do you have something like a, you know? Well, yeah, we uh, Tehran for me. Well, I was in Tehran until I was well from 1946 when I was just three years old, because my mother is Polish. We came to Poland from 46 to 49. My mother was looking to see if her mother, her father, her brothers were, had survived the war. Well, she couldn't find them. And in 49, we came back to Tehran. And until I was 21, until 1964, I lived in Tehran. I finished my high school there. And then I immigrated to the United States in 1964 to California. But when you when you try to find you know the, the oldest memories right recalls do you remember like maybe Poland or Tehran like Poland I don't remember much because okay. I was three years old to six years old I remember a few things I remember the sanatorium because I got uh, Poland I got a lung infection they sent me to a sanatorium in Zakopane that I remember we used to uh, sleep in the balcony in the afternoon under blankets. And uh, I had a very nice nurse. I have pictures of that time. Tehran, I remember only a few things from the first grade. It was an American school, a very nice primary school. school. Primary yeah. school, school, yes, okay. it was very nice. And then I remember the 1953 coup d'etat when the Shah left the country. I was 10 years old by then. The Shah left the country, Mossadegh took over. Then, with the help of the Americans and the British Secret Service, the Shah came back. They arrested Mossadegh. And after that, everything is, I may remember everything. Because after that, I went to high school. And uh, the last six years, everything is very crystal clear. Mm -hmm. And uh, we used to go on vacations to the Caspian Sea. Our neighborhood was a lower, lower middle class neighborhood. Almost everybody was Armenian. Mm -hmm. In Tehran. In Tehran. Yeah. Uh, there was a huge Armenian community. We had two churches, so Armenian was... Uh, all my friends were practically all Armenian. We had some Muslim friends, Iranian friends, some Jewish friends, Zoroastrian friends, Baha'i friends, but all my close friends were Armenians. Our neighbors were all Armenians. So what about the Poles? Ah, the Poles, very good. The Poles were different. Because my mother was Polish, and when we came back, the Polish embassy, the ambassador was a magnificent man. I wish I could remember his name, but I'm sure it's in the file somewhere. Ambassador to Poland is very easy to find in the files of the Foreign Ministry of Warsaw. He would give once or twice a month, he would invite all the Polish women or Polish wives, because many Poles who had come to Iran after, uh, after uh, Sikorsky and... Uh, Maisky. Maisky made an agreement. The Poles were, the, many of the Poles, almost 100,000 Poles who were in Siberia and other places in the Soviet Union came to Iran. And some of these women married Armenian or Iranian Muslim men, and they had children. But the children were all very Catholic. They would always go with their mothers to Catholic church. And the embassy would invite these Polish women with their children to come to the embassy, we watched Polish movies. We danced, the, they taught us how to dance the Krakowiak with the uniforms, mazurkas. And uh, of course, boys, we, we didn't want to, but we learned. And so we had strawberries and cream, watch Polish movies. The husbands never came. My father never went, the husbands never came because Poland being communist and Iran being very pro-American and very anti-communist, uh, the men were afraid to go to a communist embassy in case somebody took their picture. 
-hmm. But the women and the children were no problem. So until I was 18, after 18, I didn't go either. But until I was 18, we used to go to the Polish embassy and we had Polish friends, but they all lived in different neighborhoods. So right. I did not see them except at the embassy. Right. So there was no something like a Polish district in Tehran, nothing like that. No. But no. Armenian? Arme Armenian there was. Armen there were many districts where Armenian middle class Armenians, uh, upper middle class Armenians and rich Armenians. There were three neighborhoods. Rich Armenians lived with where rich Iranians were. Upper middle class Armenians had their own neighborhood and then the lower middle class Armenians, which we were, Mm -hmm. had their own neighborhood. That means we rented. Okay, you are not the owners. Yeah, of the upper class. middle class Armenians had small houses. Uh, the rich Armenians had villas. So, and they had swimming pools, etc., etc., and gardens. You said you went to the, the primary school in Tehran, but it was run by the, by the Armenian church, priests, or no. it was... No, 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 I didn't. We had Armenian schools. Right where they learned Armenian. Um, but the quality of the school was more parochial. Uh, it was for learning Armenian, uh, organized by the church or by the political Armenian Dashnak party. And there they learned, Persian they had to learn. The curriculum mm -hmm. was Iranian, that's the government rule. But they also learned Armenian. My mother didn't want me to do, not that because she was anti-Armenian, but she felt that it would be more important for my future to go to a private school, more expensive, and we always had problem paying the tuition. Hmm. At the end of the year, always the, uh, the school principal would call me quietly to his office and say, tell your father he hasn't paid for this A month. Fee for yeah, this it was yeah. very embarrassing. But, uh, but she sent me to private schools. The first school, the kindergarten and first grade one, was an American school. It was an Armenian woman who had married an Armenian doctor, very rich. She had studied in the US. She couldn't have children. So she created this school for very expensive. I mean, all the, everything was American. The textbooks were American. We only spoke English. American, not English. American textbooks, everything. And so after that, I went to American missionaries, Presbyterian, Protestant missionaries, had opened a school. Even before that, they had a school, but they opened this school f f up to grade nine. Mm -hmm. And there, again, the curriculum was Iranian, uh, Persian, mathematics, chemistry, etc., etc., uh, physics, algebra. But the English was taught by an American from the United States. Okay, so and so we spoke, uh, not all of us were very good. I happen to like literature and language. So I did better, not because I'm brilliant, I just liked it. Some people are good in languages, some people are not. So I always was number one student and the American teacher loved me very, very much because of that. And we also had a class in Bible studies, mm -hmm. Presbyterian Bible studies. It's very different than Catholic. Presbyterians, you know, Protestants are very much involved from the time of Martin Luther to read the Bible, right. to know the Bible. That was very important. We had that class too. So I know the Bible very well, actually. And then after that, I went to Catholic school, Silesian brothers, Don Bosco, mm -hmm. Italian Irish brothers, mm -hmm. a very, that was the most expensive school in Iran. And it was for the very, very upper class. There were very few Armenians there. In fact, I only had one Armenian or two Armenian friends there, and he was very rich. The rest were children of the ministers, Iranian, prime ministers, family of the queen. And so, but one good thing about that school was because it was Catholic, we all had to wear uniforms. Okay. And the uniforms had to be bought from a certain store. So the family of the queen and me were wore the same clothes. Yeah. So there was no psychological problem. Of course, the only difference was they would come to school driven by chauffeurs and Mercedeses. I would take the bus. That's the only difference. But once we entered the school, we were equal. We were equal. Right. And there I had friends, a lot of Muslim friends, but not that we were anti-Muslim, but 
Muslims and Armenians did not go to each other's houses. Mm -hmm. Very rarely. In the school, outside, movies, soccer, football, no problem. Very close, there's no problem. But to each other's houses we wouldn't go because they had sisters, I had a sister, and none of the, it, even though under the Shah, uh, Christian boys did not go up with Muslim girls. That means but the Don Bosco school, how you, yeah, how we call it, yeah, Don Bosco. Yeah, so you had, uh, there were uh, women and uh, girls no, and boys? No, 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 no. Only in, for Iran, no. in Iran, the law was very strict. No matter what school you were, boys and girls did not go to school. Okay. Government school, private school, no. Okay. We only had, therefore, that's the main thing. So I could not, I never would dream to even think, although I prefer, the Muslim girls were much prettier, much, much prettier than the Christian girls. They were like goddesses, their eyes, their eyebrows, dark, gorgeous. It, it wouldn't even, th we wouldn't even think about it. Hmm. And so, and they wouldn't think about our girls either. So all my girlfriends were Ar Armenian. By men, I mean girlfriends, we went dancing, right. we went picnicking, nothing, uh, nothing extra more than that. It was a very conservative society. And then, so, but the school was unbelievable. Uh, the people who taught in that school, the professors, not just the English, of course the English was unbelievable. I had an Irish brother, Brother Byrne, who taught me English. Uh, he taught me so well and I liked to read so much that even before I came to the United States, he arranged for me to take the Cambridge O-level English exam in the British Embassy. They had once a year, the exam would come from Cambridge, closed, you would open it, you would go to the embassy, you would take the exam there, they would send it to Cambridge, and if you passed, you would get a certificate of O-level English. And I was one of the few that got that. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was, I got a gold medal in English uh, from Don Bosco when I finished the 12th grade. I also got a medal in running because I was a 100 meter, 100 meter runner. I was very fast, 11 seconds. 100 meters, but no, 11 seconds is nothing. You know, it's one, one millimeter, one hundred of a second uh, differences. So it was a very good time. And then my mother kept on saying that uh, she was right. It's all my mother, because my mother was educated. She had a master's degree in Poland. She was 20. She was spiritual smallness yeah. of all the, you know, every, every activity in your house. Every right? activity. She knew German. She knew Polish. Of course, she learned Russian. She learned the Persian. She learned Armenian because she lived with my father's family and she was an orphan. She had nobody. She was, I must have gotten the talent of languages from my mother because she could learn languages I couldn't believe. I mean, the speed and the, Mm -hmm. comfort. And so she was the one that decided, she said, look, it's a good country. My father never wanted to leave because my father was a man that didn't care about, he was not ambitious he, as long as we had a little apartment. And he was the Armenian from Baku, right? From Baku, he was very socialist in his upbringing and he didn't think of capitalism. He could have been very rich. When he arrived in Iran, you could buy land in Tehran for a few pennies. Uh, those lands later became the price of New York. I mean, <laughs> and other people did it. He wasn't interested. So uh, my mother said, it's a wonderful country, but you have no future. Mm -hmm. Because by law, Iranian law, a Christian could not work for the government, could not be the head of the department, could not rise any major position in the army, unless the Christian had his own business. Like my father was a plumber or mm -hmm. if you had a bookstore, if you had a bakery, or a Jews had carpet stores, you know, they, we couldn't write, we had to have a business. And I wasn't a business, I didn't have good hand knowledge of doing anything electric or anything mechanical. Mm -hmm. So my mother said, you're wasted here. So we, I immigrated, well, I, we put the immigration papers, I went just a few weeks before mm -hmm. to California, and it didn't mean... So you were pretty sure that you want to go to the United States? Yes. Okay. Not like Great Britain or... To no, 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 France. no. We were, no, no, we were no. very Americanized because you see, okay. uh, the Shah of Iran had became so pro-American and America was in control of Iran basically, 
that uh, we had uh, 55,000 American personnel, 55,000 living in Iran, and they were above the law. Mm -hmm. I mean, you couldn't touch them. And so they had their own school, actually. And that's the school that we, all of us boys, were very envious because mm -hmm. we would go, it was called American Community School for American children. And we would go there and see it was a big school with, uh, with, with metal, metal gates, beautiful gardens, and we would see boys and girls because they were mixed. Ah, oh, right. Boys and girls lying on the lawn, mm -hmm. hugging, kissing. Whatever, playing uh, together. Playing to nothing, nothing too much. Right. But we would never dream to do that in the street in the open to touch a girl, are you kidding? Even if she was Armenian, they wouldn't work. So we were so jealous. They were there, they were all smoking. I mean, it was like very different from our. Um, and of course, we had American television uh, for American personnel only in English. And most, of, uh, most Iranians didn't watch it, but because I knew English, I watched all the American television shows, mm -hmm. American movies. So when I arrived in Los Angeles, for me, it was n not like I've arrived for a strange country. I wasn't nervous at all. Right. In the third, four days, I was working in a store because I, I worked a little bit part-time in Iran in a music store selling discs, American discs, classic and jazz. It's, so I knew that. So uh, I got a little letter from that man who had the store in Tehran. So when I came to United States, I came right before Christmas. They were looking for some people to hire extra because mm -hmm. Christmas rush. Right. Mm -hmm. And I walked in with this paper and they looked at it. They said, this guy knows. And especially classical music, something that in the United States most people did not know very well. They needed somebody to sell classical music. And I got hired right away, right away. And I started working. Unlike most immigrants, I came with only $30. But you, you came with the whole family? The family came a week later. Oh, okay. So I helped them. By plane? By plane, yeah, direct. Uh, actually, Tehran, Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv, Paris, Air France, Paris, Los Angeles. Right. And uh, the family had a much harder time. My father had to work at a job that doing welding in trucks. My mother went working in the hospital washing floors it, at, at first. My brother who didn't know English. But she was educated nurse, right? Yeah, but that she couldn't find a job yet. Okay. And, and, but slowly, she learned English. You see, she mm -hmm. didn't know English, but she learned it very fast. And eventually, she became a nurse in surgery. So wow. she went up. My father never went up. He okay. remained the same. <laughs> he never liked it. My brother worked at a very collecting dirty clothes and selling them. Not he didn't. It's a company. And then he ended up working, and he like, was my father. He liked working with his hands. Right. And then he, he worked for a place that fixed clocks, and eventually he opened his own company. And now he never finished high school, and now he's doing much better than I am doing because he has a <laughs> business, which is wonderful. You know, I'm very happy. But he's a very different person. And so... Then also, I went... Yeah, how was, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in the, your relation with your mother, right? Because it's, it's quite interesting that you, you've got this, you know, Polish origins, we can say, right? We are now in your motherland, yes, we can yes, say. Yes, yes. And what, was, what upset me very much is when I came to Poland the first, first time mm -hmm. uh, in 1974. Mm -hmm. I was in Armenia working at the Matanadaran for my doctoral dissertation. I got a grant. And my friends in Yerevan said, well, you have an American passport. Why don't you go to Poland? We will pay the airplane ticket. Right. Just go to Poland, bring us shoes. Because it was during communism, you know, they didn't have many t style of shoes. Mm -hmm. So they said, we'll give you money. You go, and they gave me number 40, number 42, because they have different numbers. So buy this stuff for us and bring it back to Armenia, because you couldn't find those good shoes. And this is 74. Right. Remember, it's not later, it's different. Get us some Polish jeans. Polish jeans were very popular in Armenia, because the American jeans were very expensive. So this is the kind of things they wanted. So it was an opportunity. 
And uh, I had met a friend. I met when I was in Yerevan. I met a Polish girl who had come for tourism there. We met, and she gave me her address. So when, uh, when they said go, I wrote to her. I said, look, I have a chance to come to Warsaw. She met me at the airport. She took me to her family house. We spoke broken Polish well, the way good. I speak, and I was very happy. They loved me. I loved them. And so I was only a week. In Warsaw, I saw Warsaw. Of course, Warsaw, even in 74, it was a, looked like a modern... Hmm. It looked like a modern city, rebuilt. You know, hotels, that big building looks like Moscow University that uh, the Russians built, you know. It was, it, was not, it was not the city that... It was a nice city. But uh, I didn't know it very well. So we went around, and then I came back with the shoes. Basically, that's the way okay, I came. That's your first experience? like uh, Well, after, this? beside the, when yeah, I was I very young, which I don't remember much except everything. But the only thing I remember when I was very, very young in Warsaw, uh, at Christmas, my father and mother had put a Christmas tree, and they had candles on it, the old-fashioned candles. And the Christmas tree caught fire, and my father had to open the window and throw the Christmas tree out of the window. So <laughs> that much, these are little things, little vignettes that I remember. My relation with my mother was very close. The problem was I left for New York. Because okay. there were no, after I got my PhD at University of California, I left to New York, there were no jobs. Columbia had a two-year uh, contract. I went to New York postdoctoral. And I met my wife there, and I married there, and my wife did not want to go back to California. Mm -hmm. She hated California, like most New Yorkers. She felt New York was the center of the world. She was born in New York. And she was Armenian, but she didn't speak Armenian. She was second, third generation, like most Armenians of that. They don't speak Armenian. And so she didn't feel comfortable going to California because I spoke Armenian with my brother, Russian with my father, Polish with my mother. She couldn't understand what we were speaking. And so she felt, and all my friends were Armenian in Los Angeles, and they were shocked that I have an Armenian wife who doesn't speak Armenian because, you know, as you know, you've been to Armenia, and, you know, they get very surprised. What kind of Armenian are you if you don't speak mm -hmm. Armenian? So. This was a big problem, and it was a problem for her from a very young age, and she had these psychological problems uh, to this day. To this day, when I meet Russians, we travel together, she says, the minute you see Russians, the minute you see Armenians, you completely, or Persians, you completely ignore me and start speaking language with them, like I don't exist. I said, but that's, it's not because I don't love you, but it's an automatic feeling. Mm. I am, I'm back into, my, I'm like a fish, that's back in my water. Of course I like to swim in my water. I mean, I, I miss it. It's very difficult for people to understand that mm -hmm. because they don't understand it. So, uh, But why did you learn uh, Russian, right? Because you said... We spoke... My father is Armenian from Baku. Right. They never went to Armenian schools in Baku. Mm -hmm. There was an Armenian school, but not much. He they graduated Russian school. He didn't graduate. He, okay, he okay. grade uh, seven or eight. He came to mm -hmm. Iran. So he read Russian only. Okay. He didn't write it very well, but he read. He liked. He had a library of Russian because he couldn't read any, any other language. Right. He came to Iran when he was thirteen, learned to speak it badly, but never learned to read and write, either Persian or Armenian. So he spoke only Russian with me and with my mother. Hmm. And my mother learned Russian. So they spoke Russian to each other. My mother spoke Polish to me only, because mm -hmm. I was the older. We, the grandparents lived with us, because in Iran they do. And my grandfather is from Van, so he would speak Armenian to me, and my grandmother would speak Armenian to me. And in the streets, we would speak Persian. So it, mixture it's one? very funny when we played bridge. I don't know if you play bridge, but when we played bridge, we would bid in four languages. My father would bid in Russian, my grandfather would bid in Armenian, I would bid in Persian, and my mother would bid in, in Polish. 
and so it's a very strange, people who came in didn't know what kind of a bridge are they playing. They're talking different languages. How can they bid, you know, one, one treffle, one heart, one this, right. one that, two this. Or when we played blot, a two, sans a two, you know, all those things we used to do French sometimes. It's crazy. Yeah. So, unfortunately, my mother remained in, in California. And she got sick, she had cancer, etc. She lived until 88. I didn't even see when she died because so she was sick and I didn't know she was in a rest home. And, uh, and she never traveled to, to Poland after no, the I, Second World No, War? and I begged her, I said, Mom, I, I, why don't you, I'm going, I've been, because I came again. In 89, I came back to Poland in 1989. And then uh, she was still alive. And I said, I went to Warsaw, I said, it's changed so much. I said, it's now they've rebuilt everything because she remembers it was completely yeah, broken, yeah. demolished. And so she said, no, no, no. And she didn't talk much about what had happened. Mm -hmm. Maybe most people who went through that tragedy didn't talk. Like you don't remember, like she did either, like in the evening, Mom is talking, uh, you know, I would the, ask, the, the Siberia. I no, I would ask what happened when they went to Uzbekistan, nothing. We were to Uzbekistan, I worked in the mine, then we came to Iran, you were born. What about your father? I had a father, mother, three brothers, we were very rich, etc. Nothing else. Uh, what happened? Uh, what were your brothers? She did not go into details. Well, right. maybe that, with that shock, mm -hmm. the shock was so much that she didn't want to give all that negative to her children. Mm -hmm. And it's very possible, not possible. One day she did tell me that she was engaged. She had a fiancé before the war. So maybe she didn't. Being in Iran and being in the Armenian community, which is very conservative, especially then, she didn't want to talk to her children that, you know, before your father I had a fiancé. One day it kind of popped out. Right. You know, so you wouldn't. Mm -hmm. In a community like Iran, where all the Armenian women, her neighbors were all uh, not educated, and they looked at her. She worked for a while in Iran. They always said she's a European, she's a foreigner. European means she's loose. Mm. That means on a pier, she dances. She, my, my mother liked to dance, talk, sing. That was a very unnatural for most of those women there who were a little bit much more okay. conservative. Right. So maybe that's why she didn't tell me too much. Mm -hmm. There was no space for that. She didn't feel comfortable. No. Yeah. No. I wouldn't either, frankly. Right. If I would went through all that situation. You were too young. Being to be arrested, uh, being taken by the Russians across the border. The men were shot or sent to Siberia. The women were sent to camps. I mean, that's a you know, and what irony happened? because she, you know, she married the guy from from Baku, you know, who was a, a socialist. socialist right? I know, I know, and they always had this argument. Ah, okay. Always, my mother was anti-Russian, anti-socialist, and my father pro-Russian, pro-Russian and socialist. And that was the one thing that didn't. So my father would say to me, don't listen to your mother. There is no God. All these churches are stupid. And my mother would come with the portrait of Virgin Mary and would cross herself. And my father would say, Dura, this is, there is no such thing, you know. And so this is a very interesting. So I grew up also in many ways. And the funny thing is I went to religious schools. Right. I read the Bible, and even in the, in the Catholic, the three years, we had to go to, m every morning before class, we had to go to the chapel. And I used to come to class at my father, home, and my father would say, did they take you to that stupid thing again? Did they tell you about this? All of this is mishmash, there is nothing. The popes are all bastards. They're this. <laughs> but the mother supported you somehow, Yes, right? mother supported. But as I grew older, unfortunately, I, did, I stopped going. Not because I was against God, 
But the more I studied, the more I went, especially to some of the problems, I saw the problems of the church, especially uh, the church angered me, the Armenian church, not the Catholic church. But what angered me is like uh, Armenian church in the United States, I don't know what it is in Armenia, but in the United States, most Armenian priests who study in Echmiadzin beg to be appointed to the United States because they get a free house, free car. The parish, mm -hmm. the Armenian parish supports them, gives them money for the children for college, right. house, salary of large salary, sometimes close to $100,000 a year, with a house, with a car. So they are, they, and what angered me is when I wanted to get married, or when I wanted to christen my children. That's why I didn't christen my children. In the, I went to the Catholic Armenian, not because my wife is Catholic Armenian. I went to get married. They give me a menu. They have a menu. Yeah. Marriage, this many dollars. Price Christening, list. this much. Just funeral and hi. I said, I thought it was supposed to be voluntary. I mean, you voluntary donation. I said, Jesus didn't ask for a menu. Yeah. Jesus didn't have a Cadillac. Some of these bishops are driving expensive. Jesus, I said, had a donkey. You are representing Jesus. If you are representing, I'm not asking you to live in Harlem, right. in the basement. But for God's sake, you know, you're supposed to be a priest. Your first job, not gold chains, expensive watch. You know, that's not the church. I said, that's why I became slowly a little bit anti, not um, because, yeah. it, I mean, when they gave me, I didn't get married. Mm -hmm. I told the archbishop was a friend of mine. I said, look, I'm going to go get married downtown. He said, but you're an Armenian professor. We want, I said, aren't you ashamed? He said, give whatever you want. I said, that's different. Don't show me menus. It's not a restaurant. So I really gave it to them. And the children I baptized in the Catholic church, no, no money. Armenian I Catholic Church. Armenian, I donated, of course I would donate. But no, they never gave a menu. Okay. The Armenian Catholic Church. And funeral I want to burn. All of us are burning. Because it's too expensive, the land, it's waste of land. The burning is very cheap, they put you in a cardboard box, $400, and they give you the ashes. Instead of having the priest coming to the, with another menu. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's, let's continue with this. Uh, you said you left uh, LA and you moved to the, to the New York. To I, the, yes, so in that's what your first job. 78. 78. No, I had a, I taught one or two classes part-time in UCLA, in Glendale. Now they have an Armenian program. I started the Armenian program in Glendale College. You'll go see it. Levon, my friend now, is in charge of it. I started that in the evening. They would give me a little bit money, one class in the evening. Now it's a program. Mm -hmm. So I real then luck happened. There was a postdoctoral grant at Columbia University, Mellon grant, very big, for two years. And it was for me to teach one class in Armenian history, but to give me a chance to change my dissertation into a book. Right. Because the dissertation got very well received, but it was just a dissertation typed. So that's when I slowly turned it into a book. I worked there for two years as a post, but there were no other jobs. So then I became the assistant director of the Russian Institute at Columbia, because mm -hmm. there were no teaching jobs. Uh, this, there was Harriman Institute? Harriman Institute. Institute. At that time it was known as the Russian Institute. Okay. Now it's the Harriman Institute. And I met Brzezinski and everybody there, you know, we had a, and, Russian writers, you know, all the big Russian writers, immigrants, right. came, we talked. I was the assistant director because I knew Russian. And then for a few months, I was the assistant rector wow. of Colombia because there were no jobs. They wanted, but I, I only lasted a few months because it was all paper. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I'm not good with paperwork. Uh, not that I can't do it. I don't like it. And also, rector has to be a man who knows how to talk and how to be polite. And not that I'm not polite, but I'm very straightforward. 
Right. If I see somebody that's stupid, I say, excuse me, you're stupid. The rector cannot say that. The rector has to be more diplomatic. But, yeah. I'm not diplomatic, as already you have seen just in a few minutes you've <laughs> talked with me. Everybody will notice. And I'm very straight. I call black, black, white, white. I don't believe in gray. So what happens is... Uh, so you, you, and then you, you decided to stay in New York, right? You I had to stay in New York. But you said that your, your PhD postdoc, right? It lasted only two, two years. years. And then I tried to find jobs. I, by then I was already married mm -hmm. and my wife did not want to go back. So we worked. She had a small job at the university. I kept on doing one class here, one class there, one class there. Uh, I always had a job teaching, but very little. I had to continue teaching so my resume would not have blank spots. Right. So I taught a lot of places, class in NYU, one class in New York University, a class here, a class there. But then I realized that the only way I could survive is to, I knew languages, and I found a company that does tourism. And for seven, eight years that I didn't, I, I couldn't find a full-time tenure track. We call it tenure track. Mm -hmm. A job that after seven years you get permanent and you're, they can't touch you after right. that. So I found a company that did tours mostly to the Soviet Union. Wow. So and I, I, these are deluxe tours for very rich Americans, lawyers, doctors, surgeons with their wives. Some of them Jewish. Mm -hmm. whose family was originally from Ukraine or Russia right. and they wanted to, they didn't, they, weren't, they didn't speak or anything, but they had some connection. Right. And so the great grandfather came from somewhere, right. a Jew from somewhere. So they would want to go and see it, but because they wanted to be first class, they didn't want to go with, it was in tourist, but special in tourist. The most expensive hotels. Uh, they had. Uh, we had uh, special arrangements. Of course, it was all paid for. Special arrangements for first row Bolshoi, first row Kirov, museums that we had certain hours for us. They even opened collections that they hadn't opened. For example, I saw the collection in the Hermitage that the Russians had taken from the Germans from Berlin, the Schliemann Gold. I saw the Schliemann Gold. Troy, the gold of Troy. Now it's even now you can't see it that easy. So I saw a lot of special collections with my group and special palaces. We went to places that most people in the old we even saw where Rasputin was killed. Now it's open. Mm -hmm. But in those days the Sheremetyev Palace, the, all those palaces were clo were not uh, tourism. We saw everything and we had banquets. Every lunch and every dinner was a banquet. I mean table from here to there. Anything you could think of was on that table. But do you, f do you felt any you know, tensions, right? Because the relations between the US and the Soviet Union were, well, you know... Not for this group. Okay. This group had no tensions. Of course, the in-tourist guide, which was always a girl, a woman, the in-tourist guide checked. You know, they she was Russian. She was well, in-tourist. Right. She was Russian, and she was. She gave the official, official talk. Mm -hmm. Later, when we were at the dinner table, I would correct certain things that ah, she okay. said. I didn't want to interrupt her. And uh, like when we were driving uh, next to Lubyanka, she wouldn't say anything. I would immediately say, "By the way, guys, this is the KGB headquarters," and she would get very n nervous that I would say something like oh. this. But very generally no problems. These people were there to shop. They were there to see. Some of them went to the synagogue mm -hmm. in St. Petersburg. Right? There's an old synagogue. That was all allowed because there was so much money they were giving. Right. But this is in the 70s. But it was officially or there were bribes? or No, no, no bribes. They had paid everything. It, everything. It was in the 70s. This was already during the salt talks were done. Brezhnev, Nixon had already talked, you know, it was uh, the open, it was much more open. Mm -hmm. Now, the first time I went in 1968 was different, but I went alone. Mm -hmm. That was different. 
72 was different. But by the time in 78, 79 AD, it was already the salt talks, everything was much more closer. So you are not afraid that you are taking the American citizens to... No, 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 absolutely no. not. It was completely, we flew on thin air from Finland to Moscow, from St. Petersburg. But we went to even Golden Circle, Vladimir, Suzdal, mm -hmm. uh, all of those cities, uh, all Zagorsk, I mean, everywhere. It was magnificent. And then we went on the Trans-Siberian. We went to Samarkand, Bukhara, Khiva, uh, Isikul, uh, Alma Ati with the American tourists. I showed them everything of the Muslim architecture. We went the train all the way to the end. We went on the uh, river cruise between St. Petersburg and Moscow with the river, with the boat. Uh, you name it, we did it. I've seen, uh, I w I w I've seen all the 15 republics, all of Siberia, to the end, to Nakhotka. We took a boat to Japan. I mean... And have you visited in that time uh, Armenia, Soviet Armenia? Yes, Armenia was 68. That's okay. I went along the first time in 72. And then occasionally I would also go to Armenia. 73, 74, I was with Matanadaran. But in the, in the 80s, very occasionally after the trip was over, if I had a chance, I would go to Baku. My aunt was in Baku. My father's sister was in Baku still. After, only after the problems, she, she died in America. They, were, oh, okay. they immigrated. But I used to go to Baku very often, to Sumgaid. I had many friends, the academy in Baku. I had to, there was no problems in those days. I mean, maybe there was, but it was under the surface. Right. Armenia, Azerbaijan, Tiflis, I went in the old days. No problem. No problem. So Sochi, Semferopol, Krim. Uh, I have been uh, places that, I mean, Kiev, uh, Katyn Monument, Belarusia, Minsk. You name it. I mean, uh, Moldova. Sometimes I think you have, you know, great nostalgia, you know. For the Soviet time? I do. You do? Ah, okay. I do. Uh, be honest, I do. Because for me, it was much better. Because we were going as special citizens. Okay. Everything was very cheap. Now I went to Moscow the last time. I went to go to the Bolshoi. I went in a very mediocre seat. I paid $240 to see Knya Ziger. Uh, $240. In Petersburg, I went to Wagner. I saw Gotterdammerung, magnificent, with Valery Gergiev conducting. It was $200. Uh, and I used to go there for a two rubles, sit in front, and everything was cheap. I love caviar, black caviar. In the old days, I had caviar every morning for breakfast. I like it for breakfast. Now, <laughs> forget it. Right, it's forget it. Yeah. Uh, Petersburg still, the restaurants are normal. But Moscow, Cafe Pushkin, you are, you, first you can't get into Cafe Pushkin because Cafe Pushkin, you, uh, you have to, and the people who park outside Cafe Pushkin are Ferraris, Maseratis, and Porsches, and the gangsters with their girlfriends. But of course, the girlfriends, everyone looks like a goddess, <laughs> uh, magnificent. And you, to go to Cafe Pushkin, you have to have $400 just to eat there, American. Yeah. So. <laughs> and probably you have to make the reservation. Yeah, no, you, can, yeah you have to have somebody to let you in. Reservation ah, won't okay. work. No. <laughs> the guy who is at the door already knows ah, everybody. Okay. You, you're a nobody. So, uh, I mean, so now I don't feel the same as I felt in the old days. In the old days, everything was open to me. I was very, they liked me too. I mean, I knew all the interest girls, I knew the managers, it was the same hotels. Like I would go back to the hotel in Leningrad, I mean, uh, sometimes two or three times a year. Uh, one of the girls would say, my father, one of the people who worked there, manager, my father, he's sick, he needs this tablet, we don't have this tablet. I said, give me the name. I'll be back in a few well, months. I'll send it from the No, from I would US. come, oh, okay, I, every cool. few months. I would come, they would be, uh, and then I would say, look, I want Bulgakov. I mm -hmm. want Bulgakov's Masya Margarita, you can't find it. Mm -hmm. It was published, but they published a thousand copies for the whole Soviet Union. Right. <laughs> the speeches of Brezhnev, they had five million copies, nobody was buying, they were sitting in the bookstore, stupid, all the way to the ceiling, and people were laughing. But Bulgakov, so she would find me a Bulgakov. Right. I would give her the medicine. 
Someone wanted jeans, someone wanted Chanel, someone wanted this, someone wanted that. It wasn't black market, I wasn't selling anything, mm. but I had this connection. It was so exchange of so goods. Yeah, so when I arrived, I was special, mm -hmm. including at the airport. They never opened me. I would go to the airport uh, the first time they opened, they saw a lot, and the next time, because it's the same people after a while, they, you know, I come either alone or with tourists. Yeah, but what about the US now? Because you said that in, in, ah. you're in the Soviet Union, you felt special, right? But when you returned to US, nobody was it. questioning you. No, like but I hated when I came back, but my wife would say to me, after two or three weeks, I would say, I miss Russia, even today. My wife got angry. She says, yes, because you feel special there. They, you're God there. Here you're nobody. Uh, so I would f miss it, really miss it. And so, uh, and after a while, even in the, even in the, airport, which so many people had troubles. I would walk in, I had a carton of Marlboro, which was one month salary. A carton of Marlboro was one month salary in the black market. Marlboro, what? Right. And I would buy it for $7, in duty free. So I would have 10 of them in my luggage. I wouldn't sell it, it's mm -hmm. not for that. So I would take it out and say to the Bagranichnik, etc. It's a gift. Hello, привет, ребята, это для вас. Right. Never had any problem. I mean, you saw in so my room, you saw in my room the last the Soviet gerb of the last train after the Soviet Union fell apart, metal. I have a whole uniform of a Russian colonel made for me, my thing, with the medals, my size. <laughs> Hat, everything. I have it at home. I don't wear it nowadays, but I used to wear it to class during Halloween. You know, Halloween we dress up. I used to wear up in class and I would walk in with that thing with the medals and the whole thing in class in Soviet. So it's fun. No, it was special. I felt special to the point that when I took my students, the last year of Soviet period, I took my students to Moscow. 55 students from Iona, my college, in winter. and. I'm sleeping up, it was one o'clock in the morning, telephone rings, the, in every hotel there was a KGB guy. Foreign, mm -hmm. these are foreign hotels. Georgi, что? what's wrong? Ваши ребята где-то в милиции. They have arrested some of your students. What the fuck have they done? He said, I'll have a car for you downstairs, I'll take you to the Police station. Police station. I went there. What have they done? They were playing bagpipes, drunk in front of Lenin's tomb at night, playing music and drunk, playing bagpipes. So they were arrested. So I had already brought a bottle of uh, Jack, Jack Daniel Jack Daniels, okay. and a carton. And I said, you know, we извините, у нас ребята дикари. В Америке они все дикие, они не культурные, не как у вас. Наши студенты не культурные, они ничего, историю не знают, etc., etc. I got them out. Three days later, again, Georgi, опять, другая ваша группа. What have they done? They climbed an official Soviet building to steal a flag. Well, students do that back home, they steal souvenirs. But in Soviet Union, there's still a Soviet flag. Again, the same thing. So you had many problems with the students, right? Yeah, but it, for me, it wasn't a problem. I was home. Yeah, now it's, yeah. I was maybe home there. Oh, OK. In US, I wouldn't have been able to do that. They knew that I like Russia. They knew I liked the culture. They knew I loved their music. They knew down deep. But you never, you know, lived there. Like that's it. That's what all my friends said. They said, you never lived here, so you don't know how difficult it is. For you, everything is fine. I lived in Yerevan the, mm -hmm. in 73, 74, the six, seven months that I lived in Yerevan. It was difficult. All oh, right. You can admit it. It was difficult, although it was Armenia. 
And it was my Armenian. They spoke the Armenians I spoke in Tehran, same dialect, same everything. In fact, a lot of Iranian words they still used in the lower classes in Yerevan. So I was home. And they also used Russian. So I of had course, no problem. Yeah. I was home. There I was very comfortable. The problem is it was winter. I didn't have the right clothes. It was cold. The dormitory was not very good. I didn't spend much time in the dormitory. I that found was in that time when you, when you were working in the Matanadara. Yes, I found friends there. I stayed at their house a lot. I found some friends that I stayed with them. And so it was a little bit easier, but it was tough. It was tough to go to a restaurant and not find, uh, you know, food. Table, uh, food. Food was there, but the menu was stupid. Right. I mean, you had to, I learned how to bribe. Uh -huh. Something that in, this, in that other part, when I went with the, since there was so much, so much deluxe, I didn't have to bribe. Yes, I would give f gifts, uh, cigarettes, etc. but that's different. Yeah, that's a, like kind of souvenir, right? Souvenir, that's and they would give me souvenirs, but I found out that in Yerevan, after a while I learned. I mean, I would need a book, that a book about Iranian war with Russia, volume two had come out, and there were only 800 copies printed, so I would say, Esgir kukuzem chuka, bachar vele, okay? Then I would say, patshat pet unem, yes, padrastem irkuan kamavel. I'm willing to give double yeah. in case. Nejam heto, come in an hour, I'll find you one. So I learned hmm. something that I didn't learn before. In Iran, we didn't have to. In the United States, there's no such thing as you <laughs> to, f to go to a bookstore and say, I'll give you double if you find me the book. They'll think I'm crazy. So, because it's capitalism. If the book is out of print, they'll make another print. And they'll make another print. They don't have to wait for a Pizziletka, another plan, to come to the next plan. You know, <laughs> no such thing. So, things like that. But any, I don't know, the, the shortage of food or something in the Shortage sh of the food stores, there was, no? no, the stores, no. Yerevan, but sh I would never have to buy because okay. the Stalovaya, Stalovaya had. In dormitory, but the yeah. But it wasn't very good food. It was mannakasha or some kind of a thing, you know, nothing. The meat was very bad always. The meat was hard and bad because the good one they had already stolen and taken it home. The stealing in Armenia, in the Caucasus, in the Caucasus, they lived better than in Russia. Everybody, even my Russian friends said, they have their own independent republics, they said. They are doing anything they want. Hmm. Anybody who worked in any place stole. So everybody had good friends to get them something. Right. Okay? Because you couldn't go and get somebody to paint your house. Because look, the apartments were government, but they would paint it once every 15 years if you were lucky. Okay, you have a wedding, you want to paint it new. It's not like the United States that you go to a paint store mm -hmm. and there is paint and you can choose your colors and you can buy things or you can hire. Only painters were government. They painted government buildings mm -hmm. once a year or once every three years. So they were always busy and there were only four kinds of paints, four colors. But you had a neighbor who worked in a paint factory. So you told your neighbor, look, here is extra money. Uh, maybe in the afternoon. No, steal. First he has to uh, steal. Yeah, first he has to steal. He right. brings the two things. He pays something to his boss. Right. He brings the cans home. Another friend has somebody who paints. On a Saturday, he will come and paint it for you. And so everything was who you knew. It's right. not who you were, right. but who you knew. Connections. Connections made a big difference. And I learned. And that made me angry because I saw some people, professors, intelligent people, who did not have connections and had to live on their salary. Yeah. But people who would work in restaurants, waiters, were all rich because you had to pay extra. I, would, I learned, I went, I said, give me a menu the first time. He brought a menu, menu, nobody looked in menu in Yerevan, they would think you're crazy. I would say, es chka, es shishlik chka, 
S, Chirka. Chirka. So once I went by my friend to my friend, I said, what's wrong with you? I go to menu, they, ah, they said, you're stupid. Let's go together. We went together, we didn't ask for a menu. Serana Patsi, open a table. Yeah. He would bring everything. Yeah. Everything he added, extra. At the end, you don't ask. At the end, he gives you a bill. He already has doubled everything. He puts it in his pocket. Then I learned. Ooh. So when you go to the restaurant, it means that you are, you know, a rich guy, right? Yes. You cannot afford, you know, yeah, menu just no. to order no. one no, no. The soup and the salad. Nobody well. would do that. Okay. They would laugh at you. Right. And the good restaurants, even in Moscow, the doorman wouldn't let you in. Right. First, you had to give it five or ten rubles to the doorman to get in. A restaurant like Uzbekistan or Aragvi, those are good restaurants. Um, Georgian restaurant in Moscow considered first class. And then there was no menu. You would even in Moscow, you would say, open the table. What do you have? Mm -hmm. Just give me some salads, some kebab, some. You don't ask the price. And then you are not checking the bill that maybe he added something extra. <laughs> no. Because you're going usually with a woman. Okay. There. You have to show up. And it's not your wife. Nobody takes wives to Aragvi. I mean, everybody knows if you're walking in Aragvi, you're going with a girlfriend or somebody you want to impress because after the dinner, you are getting something. So it is all, it is all, no, it was simple, very simple. So that, these little things bothered me at first because I come from a country where you get a menu and uh, the price is there and there's no games. Yes, at the end you give 10%, 5%, uh, 15% tip. Yeah, tip. But, but this kind of a game of playing the game is, and it's very easy to get into that. But you have still that kind of, you know, pakazucha. Yeah, pakazucha. So you, yes. yeah, you have to show up yes. that you are rich, you can, you yes. know, you can order everything. Yes. Yes, because you have to show to your friends or your you girlfriends or the woman that you are special. And some women like that, those special class of women. Obviously, a girl who is intelligent is not going to go out with a person like that. Because right. that person doesn't know how to talk about mm -hmm. anything mm -hmm. except his car or something. You mentioned also that when um, then after you um, you finished working for for this uh, tourist company agency I don't know how to call it you uh, then you um, you returned to the to university right finally finally at age 45 Four. already with one child and one on the way right I found the first full-time tenure track job that means I had to start at year one Mm -hmm. I still had to do seven years before I was ha permanent. Right. So and that was like the step backward. Yeah, they it had was. to test me for seven years. And right. after seven years, they could have said no. Hmm. But of course. It that was, was at the Columbia, right? It was no, no. This college, Iona, Iona. The small one. 40, I've been there 30 years. Wow. This is my 30th year and I'm retiring next year. No, this was the first, first job. But I was no problem. Because it was a small college, I had no problem. I knew that I would get very fast right. up because I was a very big fish in a very small pool. Hmm. In Colombia, there were many people who were good professors, who knew languages, who had published. Iona. You were a star. I was, I'm still considered a star because I have now over 30 books. And in our entire department combined, maybe if you combine all their books, maybe four, maybe five. The, everybody else. So obviously languages, etc., travel, conferences. I mean, I'm in a different. So I became very fast from assistant to associate to full professor with tenure in six years. It's a record. They mm -hmm. had never had anything like that. I had one or two books every year. So they went crazy to the point that I ended up having enemies. Hmm. People did not like... Uh, they They're being jealous. Yeah. No, they, yeah, jealous. The rector and the president love me. Those because I give the name of the college everywhere on radio, television, I interview. You know, I do government stuff. 
so they know, so they love me because it puts the college right. in a good light. Right. And then every professor has a website. The college has a website for professors where they got their degree, what books they have published, etc. You know, mine, mine, they have to have four pages <laughs> to put everything in. So all of this, li I didn't do it. They do it. It's not, mm -hmm. I, I didn't ask them. But this is, helps them. So uh, if I need something, I get it. I have the best office. I have air conditioning in my office. I have my own parking space. You know, just little things like that. Yeah, okay. So which makes it unhappy for other people. Mm -hmm. So, but that's all right. It's all right. You, you also mentioned that when we were in a, in a cafe about uh, Afghanistan, that's a quite interesting well, story. Well, that I shouldn't talk about that no? one, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's just an adventure. Right, okay. But you have, you had... I have many adventures, right. many, many adventures. I've been to many countries, over 130 countries. I've been, it's not because, I'm, the reason I've been because I went free, not because I'm rich. I eventually created my own tour, tour arrangements. After I learned how to do tourism, right. I started making tour, tour for my students, for professors, for my friends and their wives, friends too, to go to places that normally people don't go, mm -hmm. difficult places. Like Siberia, I took them on Trans-Siberia, I took them to Machu Picchu, Cusco, Amazon, we slept in the Amazon forest, Galapagos Islands, Vietnam, Cambodia, Bhutan, Burma, those are difficult countries to go. Uh, Nepal, Tibet, not easy places to go. So I took them to crazy places like this. Mm -hmm. Cambodia, etc., Bangkok, Fiji, Australia we went, we jumped parachutes. I jumped from the plane with parachutes with them, uh, scuba diving on, in the barrier reef. I do crazy things. My wife thinks that I have a death wish. She says, you're gonna, you love to, you're gonna, ex you want to die, you are, you are constantly playing with death. No, you just, you know, I you said, just love your life, I right? said I have high adrenaline, I am adrenaline junkie. She calls me adrenaline junkie. You need adrenaline to work. She's completely different. She's a quiet, very nice woman, totally different from me. And she's a saint because to live with somebody like me who is very fast and very energetic is not easy because I can't sit still. Right. I'm constantly running around and uh, she is completely the opposite. Let, let's uh, maybe, you know, we will try to I will ask you the last question, maybe, because we are getting... That's all right. The last light. question is fine. <laughs> Just um, because... Oh, you yeah, it's approaching my lunch time. That's, that's yeah, what I want to on. say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you mentioned that you, you have visited Krakow before, right? This is not your first visit. Krakow was in 1989. Mm -hmm. we just before the, the collapse of yes, the Soviet Union we, all this yes and so this is democratic yeah, and I am I am I love Krakow in fact I'm coming back with my wife 100% mm -hmm. because this is the kind of city that she would love mm -hmm. and the city is special I just feel very bad that I did not keep up speaking Polish with my mother because I left mm -hmm. to New York because I understand Polish very well, but I feel very bad. My mother would feel very bad wherever she is that her son has come to Poland and doesn't speak Polish fluently because I used to speak it as when I came back to Iran in 1949 for three years, my babcha, the woman who took care of me in Poland, mm -hmm. she was an old woman. I have a picture of her with a handkerchief very skinny after the war. So I only spoke Polish with her. So when I came back to Iran, my father's family was shocked that what happened to George, he can't speak anything else. He only speaks Polish. Again, then I b went back to speaking <laughs> the languages, right. but Rational. so unfortunately, I will try now to watch more Polish movies. We purchased a lot of Polish films 
and I'll try again to practice more and more and more. If I stay in Poland for three months and speak Polish every day, it will come back. Watch television every day, it will come back. Perfect. Not perfectly, I wouldn't be able to lecture in Polish, but I'll be able to speak comfortably. So, and the Krakow in 89 was again, it was a company, because I knew tourism, the Museum of Natural History and Metropolitan Museum hired me mm -hmm. because after these trips, many people, rich Americans, told the museum that, look, why don't you hire George for museum trips? Okay. And there were, after Eric Honecker fell, he didn't like to fly. Your friend, Eric Honecker, you know, your neighbor. So he had a train called the Red Prussian, private train that had bathrooms, lecture halls, cinema, everything, uh, showers. Uh, the American company hired this train, Berlin, Istanbul, for the museum members at $14,000 per person. Part of it was going to the museum, so it was a donation, mm -hmm. so you could tag tax deductible as we call it. And they hired me to be the speaker to give the history of Eastern Europe and... On this trip from Berlin to Istanbul. To Istanbul and the history of the Ottoman Empire since I, I was teaching that. I mm -hmm. still teach history of Ottoman Empire and Eastern Europe after communism and Ottoman Empire in the old days. So I would, uh, we, we would stop. And everywhere we stopped, there was an orchestra Carpets in the train station. I'm not joking. Prague, carpets with orchestra. Private tour of Prague. Private Philharmonic Prague, just for our group. There was nobody else. On Prague Castle in the balcony, champagne. Again for our group. Back to the train to sleep. Same in Budapest, same in Krakow. We had a side trip to Auschwitz. Then in Budapest, we had a side trip to Lake Balat, Bat Balaton, Balaton and all those horses. We rode horses there. I mean, then to Bucharest, then to Dracula's castle, then to Sofia, then to Plovdiv, where the Armenian community was. They didn't know. I went to the Armenian side in Plovdiv. And finally, Edirne, and finally, Istanbul. And in, in only two places we stayed, three nights hotel. Kempinski in Berlin, which is beyond, beyond star, and Shiragan Palace, which is again beyond the price in Istanbul. The Royal Shiragan Palace Hotel, which is unbelievable. And luckily I, could st I wouldn't be able to do it, but because of them, right. and again, caviar, champagne on the train, I mean, the cooks, you name it. Lalique, everything was Lalique glass, expensive. I mean, uh, this was... And that was just before the, 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 the collapse of the... Of it the was right... The block here? Yeah, right. It's at the end already. It was oh. collapsing. Right. So they hired the train. And most of the, the you know, the, the passengers, they were American? All American. Oh, all Very American. rich. Not Europeans. No, 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 no. It was American museum trip. Museum right. members from New York. And they wanted somebody, uh, the trip had to be deluxe, but they also wanted somebody, a professor, right. who would explain to them, what, where are we going, you know, this. So I explained about the Jagiellonians when we arrived in Krakow. But it wasn't this Krakow. It wasn't this beautiful stores and, you know, all these restaurants and all these cafes. It was nice, but not like today. Hmm. It has changed. And the people are different. Not only the dressing, but the faces of the people, their relaxation, a little bit more smiling. You know, in the communist period, people were were sad, <laughs> were sad and they were serious. They were very serious. Everybody was running to get something or to get some new shoes or something that arrived. You know, everybody had headaches. Not that you don't have headaches now, but they are different headaches. Right. They were different headaches. So it's a different adventure. But what you should ask me, which you didn't ask you, how, since this is for Armenians, right. well, no, I'll talk about that with the students. 
or the ones who are studying Armenian studies. There I'll explain how I became an Armenian studies major, because that's a totally, it was nothing, I didn't, it was not what I planned. It came totally out of the blue. I'll tell when we have talking with our students. Yeah, but just maybe you know that. You, know, you want it here yeah, too? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Well, I wanted to be a medical doctor because in Iran there was no such thing. Either you're an engineer or a doctor. Right. The Iranian schooling system for the boys. Right. So even applying for the scholarship in Poland to become a doctor. Yeah, well, there was a scholarship which you <coughs> know I told you that unfortunately the scholarship was given to me. Yeah. The Polish government gave a scholarship. The ambassador, Polish ambassador, wonderful man, he called my mother. He said, look, we have a scholarship. The Polish government has given a scholarship, full scholarship, seven years in University of Warsaw, mm -hmm. either engineering or medical, everything included, Shisko, Shisko included. And uh, uh, you go to the Iranian Ministry of Culture and the scholarship is there. I went, yes, it was there. I filled the papers because it had to be for somebody whose mother or father were Polish and were living in Iran. So I qualified. I kept on going and going and going. Finally, the man got sorry for me. He said, look to me quietly, called me and he said, Monsieur, Monsieur, Monsieur Georges, French way, you're wasting your time. I said, but there is it. He said, yes. It's formality, we said thank you to the Polish government, but it's a communist government. We're never going to send an Iranian to a communist country. And even if you went there and you came back, there's you, no future for you. There was no future because as a, you, in seven years, we would assume you already were brainwashed yeah. and you're a communist as a spy or said, said, no, we don't want you here. The Americans would never approve of you. So f don't waste time. But the way it happened is when I came to the United States and I was, again, I was stupid. I got one of the highest grades in biology and everything. I, all my Muslim friends, who, later I met some of them in America, they're all doctors now. All doctors, uh, medical doctors, specialists, and they were below me, uh, which was funny. I came, to, unfortunately, I came with no money. So I came to Los Angeles, I had to work the afternoon and night shift in the record store. The record store was open till two o'clock in the morning. Hollywood was the biggest record store in the United States. The whole world knew about it. Mm -hmm. And I, I became very, I was there four or five years. I became the manager and uh, because I know my, my, my music. So what happened is all the medical labs, the laboratories were all in the afternoon in the university. So I couldn't take it. Right. So I looked around, at first wanted to be a Russian major, then I wanted to be a literature major, then I wanted to be a music major. For a few years I wasted time. Then in 1969 UCLA, after the few years wasting time, it took me time to, I took one or two classes because I was working. I was at UCLA and I went to a class of Iranian history. The Iranian professor said, you can read and write Iran Persian? Yes. Then I took a class with Hovhannesian. Hovhannesian said, you know Armenian? Yes. Then I took a class in, in Russian, Russian history. All of them got together and said, look. And they had just opened the Middle Eastern Center two wow. years ago at UCLA. They had no students, all these professors we're sitting with very few students, graduate students, will give you stipendium. Three of them. I got three stipendiums. So I could buy a brand new car every two years. <laughs> so I liked cars because in Iran I had bicycles. Right. So this is a psychological damage, you know, you need to have something you didn't have. So, uh, and I became a major, something that would never occur to me. And until I became a graduate student, I wasn't serious. Mm -hmm. I got stipendium, I had girlfriends, I ran around, I had good time, I didn't study very well. I mean, I did my papers, but I didn't put 100% effort. Right. Only when I became a graduate student, I realized that this is serious. And slowly, slowly, uh, under the direction of these three professors, I became a serious student. And then I got the thing to go to Armenia, I got grants, I got thing, 
and it came totally, totally very strange because my mother, when she became a nurse in surgery, one day my mother is in surgery, I'm already in New York. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother calls me, she says, I'm in the surgery, a doctor looks at my name, Burnutian, and he asks me, do you have a son named George? I said, yes, Muslim doctor, Persian. He says, which hospital is he practicing in? Because I was above them. Right. They were sure that you, you yeah, became they were, a doctor. Yeah, they were completely yeah. below me. And uh, my mother said, no, he's a prophet. History? <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure it's the same George? She says, yes. So now you know. I think we had enough now, huh? Thank you very much. You're very welcome.